Hi, I'm Dr. Christy Winters here for CESTA Training. And I'm Yannick Brucker, also here for CESTA Training. In the last video, we talked about why researchers and policymakers use harmonized variables to understand human behavior, societies, and cultures. We gave a brief historical overview of harmonization and international standards. We talked about ways of harmonizing and the elements that go along with harmonizing and different harmonizing strategies. What are we going to talk about today, Yannick? So now we can move on to the process of harmonization and we will provide you with some tips and cautions when processing and challenges you might face and we'll also have a look on quality criteria and finally we end up with some examples from large international survey programs. That's a lot to cover. Let's go for it. In the last video we focused a lot on actual variable harmonizations and the variables themselves, but in fact harmonization is something that can happen throughout the data research life cycle. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about that, Yannick? Yes, so through all the data life cycle, in each step you might consider harmonizing the step, which means before you go into the field collect, collecting your data, you might already think about harmonizing uh, the data collection methods and the questionnaires. This can include a lot of work, so it is advisable to follow a systematic design and to include expert or methodology groups if you want to really harmonize big parts of your data life cycle. Ideally, you can also gather feedback on the analytical usefulness of your data and you implement quality controls on which we'll have a look later on. So seeing that planning is really everything, do you have further tips and cautions for us when harmonizing primary data? I looked at some advice given by Hofmeier Zotnik, also Hofmeier Zotnik and Wolf, on rules or guidelines for harmonizing variables. And here are the rules and advice that they gave. First, it's really important that you agree on a common definition for each variable that's measured. That common definition should refer to comparable elements of all the participating countries in your data set. So not all countries everywhere, but it has to apply to the countries that you're putting your field researchers in there to do your survey co data collection. Also, you should identify areas of common ground that underline national concepts and structures explicitly as part of your harmonization process. The next step, once you've got your concept work done, is to decide on what they call a valid indicator respecting variables of interest and national manifestations. In other words, you need an observation that actually maps onto the concept. The fancy way of saying you need something that actually measures what you think you're measuring. Then you choose your harmonization strategy, whether that's going to be more stringent or flexible or variable by variable approach. So for everyone who does a harmonization project, you can think about really being rigorous in your concepts and then being rigorous in your definitions, being rigorous in what your measures are, and that will help provide that comparability and compatibility for uh, across your countries and or across time periods. The last thing I'll mention that we should explicitly state as part of a harmonization process is multiple languages. You really have to do some work on translating the language of the questions and the response options and think about comparability. So, especially if you're doing cross-national research, thinking about language is a really important part of the questionnaire and response option design of a survey. But that's all for people who are primary investigators and have the luxury of creating their own surveys. What should people do if they have secondary data analysis that they have to work with? Most of you will probably face harmonization when working with secondary data. So those steps are a bit different as you reuse your data. Granda et al. propose five steps basically when working with ex post harmonization. First of all, you should identify usable existing data. Secondly, you define your variables of interest. Next, you have to make sure that those cases of interest are also corresponding the variables from the selected survey. Then you have to decide on a mapping scheme which you use to harmonize your data. And finally, you should record your original variables to your target variables. 
In terms of having a hard time with harmonizing variables from different countries, you might come across the problem that the different ways that a variable has been coded or measured creates a problem for you to harmonize your variables. You might end up with secondary data sets that have different definitions for a similar concept. Like they might measure unemployment slightly differently or the concept of citizenship. There are also the challenges we mentioned before about differences of sampling or collection design, which means that even though you can compare the results, maybe the populations are a little bit different, and that's making the variables less comparable. And the final challenge as we're moving forward in the 21st century is increasingly social researchers have to be aware of the legal environment around data protection and data privacy. Like recently we had the GDPR go into effect in Europe, and that's really meant to try to address the issue of data privacy and data protection. All of that leads on to the issue that we want to talk about in this video and focus on, which is quality control and quality checks. Rhonda Vlasek had some advice about conceptually organizing harmonization in a way that you can think about the quality of your data. Do you want to go over those three points? So they proposed that you should have an eye on the consistency of your data, which means that you have a certain similarity of results from multiple independent harmonization efforts. Also, you should watch your completeness, which is the degree to which the original information is preserved in your harmonized data. And finally, and we already had that often, is the comparability, which is the degree to which the harmonized outputs from different statistics can report real population differences. So with all those criteria in mind, you can guarantee a high quality data harmonization. But it's not about standardizing just everything. You, should, you will have certain trade-offs between the different quality criteria and it might even come to conflicts between the criteria. For instance, if you want a high degree of international comparability, that might be affecting the completeness of your data because you just lose information when standardizing everything and making it very comparable. That's all really good information to know, Yannick, and I think what would really help is if we looked at some real-world examples of how actual survey programs are organized in order to make sure that they have very high quality, harmonized data from every step of the research data life cycle. So we're going to look at three examples, the European Social Survey, the European Value Survey, and the International Social Survey Program. So starting with the ESS, they have two types of data that they harmonize. They do input data harmonization and ex-ante output. We talked in the previous video about the different stages and that this shows that it's not you have to do input or ex-ante. You can mix them up depending on what your variable needs are. They also have a standardized set of survey specifications for each participating national coordinator, and that comes down to the harmonizing the collection process element. The things that they focus on in particular when it comes to harmonization are the questionnaires and translations, the preparation of data collection and sampling, the data collection itself, and then they think about harmonization during the data processing and delivery phase. And when it comes to translation, which is always a challenge for international surveys, they have a translation team as well as a translation expert panel to make sure that they're doing the highest quality translation work possible. What about the EBS? The EBS is also working with input and ex ante output elements. And it is especially careful about its translation process. This is based on a master questionnaire which they design and then distribute to the national groups and to guarantee the highest uh, quality for the translation they um, follow a team approach according to a trapped method they use a translation management tool and they have corporations between shared language countries such as french speaking or german speaking countries and all of these methods and management tools can be found and looked up on their website, which might be also very informative for you. Another example of a large international survey is the ISSP. So how do they design their harmonization process? 
Yeah, the International Social Survey Program has a common source questionnaire and they occasionally leave space for country or culture specific interpretations to allow some flexibility. Since 2001, the ISSP has been using ex ante output for background variables. They often use the international standard classifications, such as the ISCAD 97 for education, measures that we're going to be talking about in a future video. In addition to that, they provide expertise training, careful monitoring, and a very detailed documentation process all along their survey collection, so they are completely transparent. Finally, the ISSP has what they call the Methodology Committee, which coordinates the work of six different groups that each address different areas of cross-cultural methods, and each of them are concerned about the idea of measures being equivalent. Those six groups are demography, non-response, weighting, mode effects, questionnaire design, and translation. This might be a lot of information for you now and you might have got very confused, but you won't be let alone and there are data archives or expert groups that might help you. Absolutely. So in addition to the actual studies themselves, if researchers want to replicate a question, if they want to kind of save themselves a lot of this work, you can always replicate questions from another survey and then you have comparability, especially a really high quality survey like the ones we've discussed here in this video. But in addition to that, you can also look at your local data archives. Check online for support from your local data archives and getting resources. And we're also going to be talking about some online website resources in a future video as well. Yeah. Yana, can you remind us now what we've covered in this video? We have looked at the entire process of harmonization when it comes to primary data, but also when it comes to secondary data. And we hope that we could provide you with some advisable steps and tips that you should consider when doing it. Also, we had a look on challenges and quality criteria. And finally, we had some examples about the process from international survey programs, which might also serve as a good orientation for your future harmonization work. In the next video, we're going to talk about international standard classifications. In particular, we're going to look at two measures that can be really hard to standardize if you're not familiar with the international standards. We're going to look at education and occupation. And finally, in that video, we're going to take a lot of the fear and scariness out of maybe harmonizing your data by looking at online digital resources that can really guide you and make sure that your harmonized variables are comparable to surveys that already exist. So, from myself and from Yannick, until next time, bye. bye! For more information on data management and creating a data management plan, visit the website sesta.eu for information, resources, and tips.